Hello, everyone, and welcome to, let's try this again. There we go. Oh, hold on one second, everyone. Just one slight technical difficulty. Boom, look at that. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final presentation of Virtual NAB. Um, good to see everyone once again. Um, it is Brian with Boris FX. We are here to show Sapphire 2020.5 with John Dickinson. Um, let me go ahead and go to speaker view. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, we have an all-star panel assembled for you guys. Some of the original Gen Arts team is here um, to talk about Sapphire um, ending virtual NAB. It's been a super fun three days. We've done a ton of live presentations. We've given away a ton of cool prizes, and that is going to continue today in the last hour. Um, virtual NAB sale is on right now. That is 50% off brand new perpetual multi-product bundles, um, Sapphire and Continuum, Sapphire, Continuum, Mocha Pro, Mocha and Sapphire, any of those product bundles, those are 50% off and 25% off all products. So if you want to get into Sapphire, if you've been waiting to get a subscription or something like that, 25% off. If you want to try the new Silhouette Paint for Adobe or OFX, that is 25% off. Everything we sell is 25% off. We have some awesome prizes we're going to give away today. Um, thank you so much to all our vendors. Let's go over what we're going to give away. We're going to give away a um, ticket to the, to the School of Motion. Um, summer session unbelievably awesome motion graphics and vf training from joey and everyone at school of motion so we're going to give away a ticket to the summer registration that is up to a thousand dollars value so that is really cool we're going to give away a one-year subscription to creative cloud i'll talk about a great prize right so someone's going to get one year for creative cloud for free we're going to give away core melts chromatic plugin we're going to give away two two boris effects bundles one year subs to everything we make um, just for you guys in this last session, we're going to give away two Boris FX bundles, one year subscription to Silhouette Paint, one year subscription to Silhouette, um, a render garden license from Tool Farm, um, really cool plugin, and a Acousnos ERA for Bundle Pro. So tons, tons of prizes to give away. Go ahead and like, subscribe, share. That's the way to enter. We are live streaming on a whole bunch of different social media channels right now. We're on a couple of different Facebooks, a couple of different YouTubes. So go ahead, like, subscribe, share. That is the way to um, enter. Um, and whatever channel you're on, just go ahead and say hello and you'll be entered to win. Um, our colleague, Jesse, who has been doing an all this week for us behind the scenes. Jesse is at home in Brooklyn and she is going to be picking from um, all the different social media channels. So let me switch over to gallery view and say hello, gentlemen. Hello. Hi. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Let me run through who we have here. We have Mr. Alan Lawrence, product manager for hello. Sapphire, creator of Particle Illusion, the man, the myth, the legend. Alan Lawrence. Hey, Alan. You can't mention particle illusion when we're talking about sapphire. We told you that. <laughs> That's true. That's no true. crossover talk. <laughs> no crossover. No crossover. Uh, John Dickinson, Professor Dickinson, newest member of the Boris Fex family, director of motion graphics. Hey, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. And Mr. Nick Rodriguez, talk about the man, the myth hey. election, VP of global sales for yeah, Boris Effects. And just Rock. out here on the front lines, just on the front lines, <laughs> doing it all. <laughs> and, in, and, and in portrait view. Yay. <laughs> in portrait view. He just does that to 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 uh, irritate me when he went vertical on us. <laughs> So uh, we are currently, like Nick and I are broadcasting from Boston, Massachusetts. John broadcasting live from Sydney, Australia. And Alan is from St. Louis. So, um, John, you know, you and I and Nick and Alan, we all go back a long way. Um, mm -hmm. Back to the Gen Arts days, back with Sapphire. Um, you've been yep. a longtime Sapphire user. Yep. I'm super excited to have you on the Boris FX team now. Um, everyone out there might know John from MotionWorks, right? Amazing training site. Um, yep. but tell which, is, us which is no longer no, no longer around but you know i am yeah you are motion works my friend uh, <laughs> but before we get started man i, I just gotta say john you you've become an amazing 3d modeler in, um in like when did you actually start to really get into cinema and modeling when when did that happen it's funny you know uh, I'll, I'll i'll try and keep it short 
when I when I started in motion graphics, and this is years and years ago. This is like 1992. Um, I could either do After Effects or I could do 3D. You know, around that time, they were really separate. But I really was interested in 3D. But I thought, you know, motion graphics is where I'm going to get more work. And uh, it wasn't until, oh, gee, maybe nine years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, that things really converged. You know, Cinema 4D got really big in motion graphics. And now you just can't know, you can't know motion graphics without knowing some 3D. And around that time, I thought, well, I'm finally going to start trying to learn how to model again because something fascinated about me, fascinated me about building assets from scratch. And I just kept learning. I learned everything I could, and I just kept taking on uh, personal projects. And now I do stuff um, for clients in my in my off time, and just continue to continue to learn more and more and more. I just find it a great challenge. It's been super fun for me to watch from afar, John. You're you're super active on social media and stuff. I had to follow your Twitter account. Um, and to see like, you know, you grow as a modeler has just been amazing. Um, we're going to yeah, see thanks. some awesome stuff today. So, <laughs> um, great. So I will be in the YouTube forums, Alan, if you could be in the Facebook forums, we'll try and take some questions. Um, we'll try and answer some things for anyone has and give John Nick sit back and watch. Um, you have had a busy couple days, so you will enjoy yeah. this one as well. We are um, monitoring Twitch too. So yeah, I know the Twitch guys Twitch. are wondering where we're, we're monitoring Twitch. So ask what up, away. Twitch, what up Twitch. Okay, John, uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to you. You can go ahead and, um, thanks Brian. You're going to play that, uh, play that shot for me. I am. Give me one second to queue it up. So it was really great fun to jump back into Sapphire. Um, and uh, think of something that I could create to to share with you today. My 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 role was to for this particular session was to show some uh, some things with Sapphire Zeebler. And uh, at the time, uh, only until recently, I was modeling this little soy sauce fish, which you can see in the playback. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun to make a little school of those in Cinema 4D and then bring them across to After Effects and build the scene using Sapphire Sapphire effects. So we're going to look at Zblur, but we're also going to look at other Sapphire effects, other After Effects effects, um, some visual effects tips and tricks, and just how I used After Effects and Sapphire to build this scene. So I'm going to break that down for you. So I'm going to share my screen. Mm -hmm. Cool. Just move, we got move you. Got me? Great. Gotcha. Okay, so this is just the, um, you can see here in the finished project, sorry, in the finished comp, um, these are all of my layers, my uh, adjustment layers and my pre-comps. But for the sake of presentation, I've actually broken it down into separate compositions to make it easy to present and also to easy to understand how I approach this. So let's go into uh, 01. So I had the fish model. We can have a quick look at that. There's, there's the fish. That was uh, uh, modeled in um, Cinema 4D by me and textured in Substance Painter and also in Redshift and rendered. That's rendered in Redshift. So really happy with how that came out. But a lot, a lot of fun to, um, to put it into an actual scene, something I don't, I don't generally do. Normally, I'll, I'll offload my, my assets to clients or... Um, you know, I'll just take, I'll just do uh, hero shots of them, put them in my portfolio. But here we've actually put it into a scene. So I needed some sort of background and I wanted some kind of ocean scene. And I built this using Sapphire effects. So let's just break this down. Currently, um, I have a pre-render. I just rendered a proxy, a full resolution proxy of this. So you see when I hit the uh, period key, uh, the zero key on the keypad, that just plays back really quickly. And I suggest that when you're using, you know, multi-layered things like this, um, that you do pre-render because it can speed up the process dramatically, especially when you're using that comp throughout uh, your project. You can see here it has proxy enabled. So I'm just going to right click and choose reveal composition in project and just turn that proxy off. Okay. So this started with some Sapphire effect presets. And there's some great presets that come with Sapphire effect. And I actually ended up using two of the ones that I created that are in there, because of course mine are the best. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's take a look. So I'm gonna solo the bottom layer. 
So this is actually sapphire laser beam. And I've used laser beam to create this kind of deep ocean. Or you can see that the, the light coming from the surface of the ocean is getting very deep very quickly and dark. Let me just click on S effect, edit effect. Actually, no, I won't click on edit effect because I haven't changed the preset much. I'm just going to click on um, load preset just to show you that preset. So you use S effect to uh, create your own effects by combining Sapphire effects, but you can also use it to preview all of the presets that ship with Sapphire. So it's a great starting point. So if I just make this a little larger and just adjust the space a little bit, there we go, now we can see them. Just bring this down. Now I know that the name of these, um, both presets actually, they're two different effects, but the name is The Deep. So I obviously did them at different times and forgot that I'd used that name. But it was good because when I searched for something that I could use in the preset browser, I found both of these and they were both very useful. So just by typing in The Deep here, you can see I've got this one. That's my laser beam and with a little bit of a description there. And this one also, which is texture flux. And this is that sort of water surface kind of rippling effect. I love this effect. Texture flux is one of those, one of those effects that I really can't do without. I use it for so many things, particularly for displacement, so useful. So I've used those two presets. Let me just cancel that. And you can see over here in the effect control panel that they have actually loaded inside S effect. If I'd have loaded, like if I'd have come up to my effect menu and chosen S laser beam, then um, I could have found, um, uh, I could have used the preset there, but um, I needed to use S effect in order to find um, the preset that I wanted, because I, I had to use S effect to be able to search for presets. If I was just to apply laser beam, then I'm only gonna find the laser beam preset. So, Using S effect first, if you're a long time Sapphire user and you haven't done that, it's a really great way to, um, as a starting point, use S effect and then search for your presets through that. Much easier to find things because I'll, often I'll, I'll know what to, uh, I don't know what I want. So I need to look at that preset browser and uh, you know, get an idea about, oh, maybe that's a good starting point. And that's exactly what I've done here. So I've used laser beam at the bottom, the deep, and I've used texture flux just above that. I'll just, I'll just solo that layer. You can see there's the texture flux, but I've actually made that a 3D layer. If I just come into a different view here, let's go into two views. You can see I made that a big 3D layer and I've rotated that. So that becomes the surface of my water, right? So we put them together and we start to get that kind of thing. I wanted to see if I could make some kind of uh, realistic depth with this just by using uh, just by using Sapphire effects and just whatever tools after effects has and 3d definitely helped with that so let's come back to uh, two views sorry one view okay so that's those layers let me just option click or alt click on three and that'll just solo that layer okay so that's a duplicate of the texture flux layer and let me just put them both together and you can see with the top one I've just it's just slightly brighter slightly brighter with a different random seed. So, because I, I thought that if you're looking at the surface of the water from underneath, you're gonna see sort of slight, slightly brighter areas as the water ripples and moves, it's gonna catch the sunlight. Um, and one thing I actually did do was play around with S rays. And I've used that later in the, in the, in the setup, but early when I was creating the background, I thought, wouldn't it be nice if for this particular layer, um, this was the one that actually caught the light, the sunlight, and then the rays came through the water. So if I just turn on the S rays layer, uh, let's see, there we go. You can see the rays coming through the brightest areas like that. Let me just turn on the two background layers. Uh, just like that. So we get that as the texture flux is animating and it's auto animation, no keyframes, it's just um, evolving. As we get lighter areas, the sapphire rays hits that and it comes through the water, which looks really nice. But I ended up turning that off because I use rays in a different way later in the in the setup. I just thought that was a really nice way to use sapphire rays. Obviously, rays and any kind of volumetric light can be, you can be very heavy handed with it, but using it in a subtle way 
is um, is often much better. Okay, so I use another version of the laser beam up the top. So just made it a little bit brighter. Just came in and adjust the the effects, uh, the the parameters for that preset, and those combined create this look. So definitely more sunlight coming in now, and it didn't make sense with that much brightness to have those rays back here. And also another version of texture flux on top of that, just to give some sort of rippling uh, down this uh, bottom half. So together, if I just turn on the proxy, we get this, um, yeah, it's, it's obviously it's stylized. It doesn't look 100% realistic, but it, it looks pretty good. And that's just by you know, combining a few presets. So that's pre-rendered or to a proxy, so it makes it much faster. So let's come into the next one, number two. So another thing I did to make this look a little more realistic was to add some distortion to the top surface of the water. And I was literally playing around with this and it was almost like a happy accident. The, I, I got a sort of a glassy surface with distort blur. So this is using Sapphire distort blur and for the lens for distort blur, I'm using this distort blur map. And you can see the distort blur map, you recognize that that's texture flux. That's the same, the deep preset that I used before. I've just, I've just adjusted the settings slightly. So I'm using a distort blur map with distort blur on top. And I get that kind of really glassy, really nice sort of water surface kind of look. And one thing to keep in mind is you can see here with layer two, with the, the effect is applied directly to that layer, it's not pre-composed. So in order for uh, distort blur to recognize that effect, texture, texture flux effect, I have to make sure that when I am in distort blur, that under lens, that effects and masks is turned on. If it's on source, otherwise it won't recognize that effect. I'd have to pre-compose. This is a, a nice feature in After Effects. So this just means no pre-composing. I can apply effects and the distort blur effect or any compound effect will see that effect applied to that layer. So if you haven't seen that before, it's really worth checking out. And obviously you can do it with masks as well. So that gives me that really nice sort of glassy effect at the top. And I thought that made it look just a little more realistic. Probably doesn't have quite as much perspective as it needs, but that's not too bad. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so next I thought we probably needed some bubbles. And you can probably hear the cockatoos outside, it's early morning here. Um, I thought, okay, bubbles, there's a few options in, uh, in After Effects, there's uh, CC bubbles, and there's foam, which is really useful. And uh, I decided to go with foam. I mean, I, a shout out to um, Brian Maffitt. Um, I still have the evolution manual here, Atomic Power. Evolution was released in 1999, can you believe it? And foam as a plugin is still just as useful as it was, what, 20 years ago, unbelievable. So if I turn that on, I'm just going to solo it and just preview that. So this is going to give me those rising bubbles. And it's got some great little features in there. It's so useful. One thing, if you're, if you're watching this, Brian, one thing I missed on this, uh, this effect um, is a pre-run setting. So I could have the bubbles already you know, uh, at the top of the frame on the first frame. But those, they're moving really naturally. It's, a, it's just such a great little plugin and in After Effects, and it has a long legacy, still very, very useful. A lot of, uh, a lot of um, foresight from Brian Maffitt with his plugins. One thing I have done with it is I've colorized it using the environment map. So if I just turn this off, I'm gonna go none. And you can see that's quite, they're, they're not very easy to see. I've used the uh, bubble texture soda water in here because I wanted, didn't want anything colorized, just wanted something white. But I did want to colorize it with the background. 
So if I just turn these all off and under, where am I, uh, environment map, I've just chose that pre-rendered background as the environment map. So of course the bubbles are going to be um, reflecting that background, which is nice. It just helps them feel a little more integrated. The other thing about this is only an 8-bit effect, so there's a limitation there. But often you can get away with that. They're just little tiny bubbles. Okay, so I'm assuming nobody has any questions just yet, so I'm going to keep going. Such a cool look, John, though. Such a building, such a cool look. Yeah, thanks, Brian. It's, um, and it wasn't necessarily... Um, it, and I always mention this when I do these kind of presentations. It wasn't necessarily like, you know, a direct... Um, steps from you know a straight line from A to B. I might have come in and done some of the background and thought that looks pretty good, then gone and done the bubbles and then thought, hmm, I need to go back to the background. Um, but when I break these down, I just I like to break them down in a sort of more logical, uh, chronological sense, a linear sense. So that's the that's the background uh, ocean and the bubbles. Let's just keep going. So what does an ocean need? It needs fish, right? Yay. So we have this little school of soy sauce fish. And these little guys I've animated in um, Cinema 4D. I've actually used a bend deformer on the tail. And, you know, I know you're looking and thinking, well, they're all moving at the same speed and they're all flapping their tail. It's the same. And I know that. I, I knew that. And I didn't have really the time in this particular project to uh, individualize the, um, the flapping of the tails. I've actually used instances in Cinema 4D. Let's, let's go across to Cinema 4D and have a look. Okay. Yes, got a question there, Brian? No, yeah. I was just going to say, it's funny thinking about it. I'm thinking about when I threw this presentation at you. <laughs> it was like a couple of weeks ago, so it's not like you've been preparing forever for this. Um, it, it is it is uh, more than acceptable that they were all moving at the same speed and flying. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm always looking to, you know, make this, yeah. um, make things as realistic as possible. And I think it's important to point out those kind of things. Of course. Um, so one thing you might notice if you, if you use, well, any 3D, take a look at the size of the school of fish. Look at the size of the camera. Really important when you're modeling that you model to scale. And actually it's like two centimeters. Uh, here in Australia, we use metric. This is this, this, the, the actual model is two centimeters long. Um, and think of the size of the camera, it's massive. If I zoom right in here, you see these tinsy winsy little fish. Let me just come into this other view. Um, what do I want? I want um, perspective view. I'm just going to turn off my camera. So you can see there's my camera, there's my fish. And you can see there's the little bend deformer on the tail. And I, I'm not, I'm, I'm by no means uh, good at rigging. You know, if I had to do some sort of big rigging job, I would probably just send it out to somebody else. Um, I'd do the modeling and send out the rigging, but you can actually get away with a lot just animating deformers. I don't know whether you'd really want to, if you only just wanted to have the tail flapping, whether you'd really want to do it any other way. Maybe if you wanted to have the whole body moving as well, you know, bending, then you'd probably use bones. But um, for me, this made more sense to have the body not bend. I thought that was really cute. You can see also, look, look, look at the top of the fish. I actually have a light, an area light in there. And these are all instances. There's one, one fish at the very top here in the school. And this is the main fish. And you can see I have a redshift. I'm using redshift to render here. I have a little redshift light in there. And that's actually putting some brightness at the top of the soy sauce, just to give it some, uh, some tonal variation. And there's all my little instances. There's, there's a little, um, so I basically created instances for those just using uh, this option here, instance. So rather than duplicating the fish and all its geometry, just using some instances and placing them in 3D uh, in, in Z. And I did use a cloner at first, but it, it's uh, in MoGraph cloner, but it's a little, it was a little clumpy. And this was much easier for me just to create one fish and just position them where I wanted them. Um, also because they are semi-transparent, and when we use Z-Blur, it doesn't necessarily work when I've got an object that I can see through the other object, because the object that you can see through, uh, the object behind, doesn't get blurred. So I wanted to make sure that there was no crossover um, in, in Z, so one fish didn't cross in front of another fish. 
And the last thing to look at here is the camera. Now I'm using um, Zeebler to, to add my depth of field. And in order to do that, I need to export a, um, a depth pass. And if I click on the camera here, Cinema 4D camera is great. It's got these, uh, it's got this focus plane here. And you can see I can, I'm focusing on this very front fish. So I can just drag that focus plane to be on the front fish. And it's got a foreground depth of field uh, amount and it's got a background depth of field amount as well, just like that. And if I come over to the camera, just give myself a little bit of space here and click on uh, details. You can see they're both turned on DOF map front blur, DOF map rear blur. If I turn that off, you can see that turns off. So it's basically how, how uh, shallow or deep the depth of field is going to be. It's probably, that's that's how, I, how I see it. So once I had that, uh, I was, I am rendering in Redshift. So I just used a Redshift AOV. This is basically just a depth pass. Um, and I just exported that out. So if you're using the physical renderer, you can just export, you know, multi-pass with a depth pass. So let me just hide that guy and come back here. So that was the, there's a rendered fish. Not looking too bad. And let me just tell them the checkerboard. You can see there is some transparency there. There's, there is basically almost no transparency, um, pretty much none here. And I, I did fight with that. I tried to get some transparency, but one of the hardest things in this whole thing was doing the subsurface scattering for this plastic. And I got a lot of assistance on Twitter. Um, and I managed to get it looking pretty good, but I would have had to spend more time to, to dial it right in to get that semi-transparency because you would see through this fish. Um, but uh, at the time, at the time with the time that I had, I just couldn't, couldn't quite get that dialed in. But, uh, maybe I will after this, someone, someone will give me some assistance. So there's the fish. So let's, uh, let's see how we can get them comped into the scene. Um, we also need to take a look at the depth pass. So there's the depth pass, which is really important when we're using Zblur. Turn that off. Turn just, so everyone, on. just so everyone knows, John, who might not be familiar with a depth pass, you're representing depth there with white through black, right? Different shades of gray. That's right. Yeah, grayscale. That's right. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So let's apply Zblur. So I'm going to keep my soy sauce fish selected and come over to my effects and presets because that's a great way to find effects. I'll just do a Z blur. And one thing you might not know in After Effects, if you've done a search here in the effect preset panel and it comes up with just one effect, you can just hit enter to apply that, which is nice, nice little shortcut there. Obviously, if there's more than one effect, it won't work. So it's worth typing in enough to isolate that effect. Okay. I've got my caps lock key on. Okay, so boom, everything is blurred. And of course, that is because I need to choose the Z buffer. And in this case, the Z buffer is going to be soy sauce, soy fish school. Sounds like a band name, isn't it? Soy fish mm -hmm. school. Depth. Okay. That's looking a bit odd. And there is the next thing you need to do is tell Z, uh, Z blur what is um, near and what is far. At the moment, it's saying white is near. So white pixels are near. But in this case, black pixels are nearest because the lighter ones are at the background. Have a look at this depth pass again. You see the lighter pixels are at the back and the darker pixels are in the foreground. So black is near. I'll just turn it off again. I'm gonna switch that from white is near to black is near. And uh, now we can start to see what's going on. The objects of the fish in the background are more blurred and the fish in the foreground are less blurred. So now I can dial this in. And never the whole point of doing it this way is you don't have to render in the depth of field when you're outputting from your 3D app. This is all done inside of your, um, inside of your compositing host, in this case, After Effects. So next, what I wanna do, there's a few ways to do this. Um, there's a few things you can touch, first of all. Um, what I like to do first is to uh, adjust the depth of field. 
you can see this fish um, wasn't totally black, so it's not totally sharp. I need to dial that in. So I'm just going to adjust depth of field. Just dial that up until that fish comes into sharp focus because he's the hero, right? He's the champ, even though he's exactly the same as all the other ones. So just dial that right in. So that's pretty good. If I want to change the focal depth, I can do that using the focal depth option. If I just drag that, you can watch what happens to the fish in the background. See how the fish in the background become sharper? Like that. And there's a little helper to help you zero in on that. If I come into show, and change result to in focus zone, you can see, okay, now he's in focus. So rather than eyeballing it, just turn on in focus zone and change the focal depth. And you can see what will and won't be in focus, which is really nice. I'm just gonna undo that and turn result back on. So I'm thinking if there's anything else I wanna show you in this just now, just checking my notes. So that's the basics. We're gonna come back a little bit um, and look at some more of that. But that's the sort of basic setup for Zeebler. You can see how effective that is just to dial in the, uh, the Z blur in this, in this particular case. Okay, so the fish are in the scene. We've got the ocean. They don't look particularly like in the scene, do they? They need a bit of colorization. And I tried a lot of different ways to do this. I tried like you know, S tritone and um, I even tried fog. There's a, there's a fog setting in, in Z Blur. If I just sample maybe a color from the water for the, for the fog and I can just adjust, you can see the, just the fog near and that, I mean, it doesn't look like fog. Obviously there's no fog underwater. And if you're doing a, an outdoor scene, then fog is fog basically. But here I was thinking of using it as sort of a colorization option. I thought maybe if the fish in the background, if I adjusted fog far, maybe the, maybe the fish in the background could go a little blue, but see how it's actually sort of washing out the whole look. So in this case, fog wasn't particularly effective, but it is going to be super effective if you've got a, um, you know, an outdoor forest scene or something like that or you know, city, a city with buildings, anywhere where fog would really be. So that wasn't so effective. So I needed to think of a different way to colorize this. And I knew that S layer in Sapphire allows me to combine two different layers, a foreground and a background. So I thought, well, maybe I could combine the ocean with the fish and colorize them that way. So I'm gonna come into 05. So for this, I used S layer. Let me just select that. And I've applied S effect because S layer is great for combining a foreground and a background, but there's no matte feature in it. I can't, I couldn't take the colorization from the ocean, the background and apply it to the fish and not see the, the ocean um, as well. I, I wanted to have the ocean separate from the fish, but have the fish colorized. Have a look. What I've done in S effect is for the background, I've chosen the background, which is our ocean, but I've also importantly for the mask, I've chosen the fish. So let's click in and go into S effect. So I'm gonna click edit effect. And this is the beauty of S effect. If an effect in Sapphire doesn't necessarily do what you need it to do, nine times out of 10, it will do it just by going into S effect and just porting in one of the tools or another effect. So let me just, uh, I've got previous selected nodes. So here's my background. Here's my source and here's the mask. So the mask is, um, the mask is also the, the same layer as the source, obviously. So the only thing I've, I've done is, apart from using S layer, so I've got a foreground and a background, 
I've also used set alpha and set alpha is available down in the tools, in the tool options in this little column on the side here. I'm just gonna twirl this up. There's probably a faster way to do that, Brian, than um, do them all at once and do them one at a time. So yeah, tools, these are great. These are for tools for compositing layers, for um, uh, blending layers, colorizing layers. I've just used set alpha. So I've just popped in S layer, uh, popped in layer, S layer, and then I've popped in set alpha just by dragging it across. And I've ported the mask into the matte port for set alpha. So now I've got the benefit of S layer, but I've also got the benefit of having a, um, a checkerboard background, right? So transparency, let me just turn this background on. Where is it? Show checkerboard, there you go, which is really good. So I mean, it'd be nice if S layer had that by default, but it doesn't really, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. So I'm gonna click okay, and let's just turn this on. Ah, see, now why would I want to colorize the fish using the background? Well, it's obvious because you want them to feel like they're in the scene, but see how the fish deeper are darker and the fish higher are lighter? Well, that's what I want because the sunlight obviously is at the top, right? And it gets darker as it goes down. So if I was just to use a blue, a, you know, a solid blue, or I could use a gradient, I guess go a dark gradient to a light gradient, but I don't need to. It's better to use the background because they're in that environment. Anytime you can use the environment to affect other objects in the environment, it's better. Just like we use the background to colorize the bubbles, right? And of course, the Z blur is turned on. It's very subtle. You can see how this fish is, um, is a little bit out of focus in the background. And I also thought about, well, if this fish was out of focus, or well, wouldn't the ocean be out of focus as well? Yes, I know. Um, it probably would, um, and that would probably take a little more work, or doing the ocean in 3D, you know, but then I would lose a lot of this great detail. So it's obviously, you know, in, in this game, it's all about what you can get away with, um, what you're prepared to get away with, and how it looks in the end. So let's just check my notes. I, wanna, I just want to check notes because I want to make sure I don't miss anything with this. Okay, so at this stage, I thought it was looking pretty good. And I did do this over a few days. I, I got to a stage like this and thought, yeah, that's looking really good. And then I got to it next day and I thought, no, it's too dark. So this is where I brought back in S-rays. And I love it when you can apply an effect and instantly make it look better. And with Sapphire rays, that's what happened. If I just turn that on. There you go. So that's Sapphire Rays, and that's literally just sitting right up here, the top of the comp. If I bring that down, it still gives it a, quite a nice effect, actually. But it's also, it's, it, but but the the point of the rays, the uh, um, the source is coming from inside the, the water, which is not what I wanted. I wanted them above, and that's really nice. It looks really volumetric. And remember, we're using this background with S layer to colorize the fish. So by turning on, uh, where am I? Uh, in S effect, by turning on effects and masks, then it's gonna recognize that S rays effect as well and use it to colorize the fish. If I turn that to source, they're no longer being colorized by the rays, right? And that doesn't look right. So once again, this little feature in After Effects comes in really nicely. Uh, I need it for background. So anything I do to the background layer, any effect I apply now um, will affect the colorization of the fish as well, which is really nice. And that makes a big difference because it looks like the rays are falling behind the fish and in front of the fish, which is so important for depth. I love how the fall off of the rays just, just doesn't quite make it down the bottom, which is really good as well. Really nice. Such a good tip working with effects and masks with Sapphire, right? That's always the oh, real, the real yeah. power of Sapphire is, is getting into those mask inputs. Yeah, totally. Totally. Uh, and I love it when you can just turn on a layer like that and go, yeah, that's the right place. That's to, it. Right, the right place to put it, you know, that's it. 
And you saw, remember earlier, I, I mentioned how I had rays and I thought, oh, I'm so cool getting it to sort of appear where the brightest areas of the texture flux were. But it wasn't effective in this case because it was sitting right at the top of the surface of the water and it wasn't affecting the fish. So it was a little bit of backwards and forwards to get the rays looking how I wanted them to look. And I thought this was quite effective. Okay, so let's um, let's look at some finishing touches. And I, <laughs> I, I had prepared this um, about a week ago and I the plan was yesterday just to go in and uh, just practice it again and make sure it all made sense and everything was set up correctly. But of course I found things that I could make look better. And uh, there's a couple of things I did that um, I thought, wow, that really you know, takes it to the next level. So I'm really glad I was able to add these little things. So there's a little list of things I want to, to um, discuss here. Now, one thing uh, I mentioned with the colorization was that these are all blue. Okay, maybe, maybe that might be like it, you know, if, like it would be for real, but I kept getting pictures of you know the Great Barrier Reef and you know Queensland in Australia and the, and the beautiful crystal clear water. And you, you, fish aren't blue unless they're actually blue, right? Dory's blue. You look for that water and it's just like an explosion of color. Um, so I wanted to get some color in there, but I wanted to get some blue in there, um, like the water isn't necessarily fully you know, crystal clear. So what I ended up doing, I tried a few different things. Um, I tried uh, dialing back the S effect, but it kind of looked a bit muddy. Um, I can show you that actually, if I come into the soy sauce fish layer, if I just select that layer and type comp, I'm gonna bring up the compositing options for S effect. This is after effects feature, not, not a, this is not a Sapphire feature. Um, a lot of Sapphire effects have their own comping options. If I just twirl down that and just decrease the S effect opacity, you can see how I start to dial back in the color like that, see? I'm just decreasing that um, S layer effect and how it affects the fish, but I don't think that looked very good. It just, they were all really uniform. It looked a bit muddy. Um, they weren't blue, they weren't colored. It was, it was a little bit of both. I thought this looked a lot better. Um, but I did want to add a little bit of color in there. So what do you do when you want to do that? You duplicate the layer. So you can see the duplicate layer above has a mask. If I just turn it on. So it's just literally a duplicate masked out. And if, remember, we've got this bright sunlight coming in at the top. Um, and I just thought, well, maybe the sunlight's making them less blue. Um, and you think, well, maybe they'd probably be in more silhouette. Um, but then the, 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 the light would be behind them for that to be more silhouette. I just like that just gives it a little bit of color, but the ones a little bit deeper aren't getting affected by the rays quite as much, so aren't quite as colored. Pretty cool, huh? I thought that was a nice little solution. Very cool. That. It, it adds a little bit of, it adds a bit of that red back in because this is a little soy sauce fish, right? And that little red cap is so, it's such an important part of that look. I just thought that would be um, a, a nice way to uh, compromise with that look. Lots of love out there. Loving your tips and tricks, John. Oh, good. Good. I'm really glad. It's, it's so, so great to be back to be able to present like this to, to everyone. And um, I have to say, being part of the Boris FX team and being able to work on these things full time rather than trying to fit them between other jobs um, is fantastic. This is, this is, I'm like a pig in um, mud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, almost. <laughs> almost gotcha. Yeah, yeah, this is a family friendly show. It's the, okay. it's the last one. <laughs> yeah, so we've got the, the colorization over the top. Let's see. Um, okay, so another thing we've added the bubbles using foam, which is, which is fine. And I was thinking I'm going to do all of this and I'm not going to use any stock footage, but Yesterday, I thought it would it'd be nice to have something in the foreground. And I decided to use some stock bubbles. And it's really, it's a funny story. This, um, uh, can everyone see my, they can see me, right, Brian? Yep. Yeah. I can make you this, Hold on. That's okay. You don't have to. This little CD, or DVD, um, is of some bubble stock footage that I used in 2004. It's for a shoot that we did at Foxtel. Um, 
And I, there was a whole lot of stock bubble footage. It was an underwater shoot um, with volumetric lay, rays. And I haven't literally opened it since 2004. So it's been 16 years. And it's been sitting up here behind, behind me or somewhere in a box somewhere. And I thought one day I'm gonna use those bubbles. And um, thankfully I've still got a, I've got a PC and I've still got a CD, a DVD drive. So I popped it in yesterday, target sequences. So no Kodak issues. And I grabbed a couple of these rising bubbles and popped them in. Let me just solo them. So, great comment. Great comment from Facebook. Teach a man to fish and he'll use sapphire. Yeah. So look at those. I thought I thought one day they'll come in really handy. Um, and that, and I, I forgot that they had volumetric rays as well. These these particular bubbles. But look at that little stream of little bubbles coming up like that. It's like like a little fish fart or something, you know. Um, it's just little little tiny bubbles. But I mean, you can create this in in you know in software, but there's nothing like realistic movement. Um, so I decided to put those guys in front and you can see I've actually just masked them. Um, let me just, sorry, let me just isolate them. I've actually just applied a couple of masks, just little soft masks, just to, um, make sure that some of these rays aren't quite, um, too, too, aren't too strong in the middle. And I've just positioned them over the sides. You know, it's that old trick of, I remember a trick when we were doing shoots years ago for corporate things and we'd be um, outside the, um, uh, the, the corporate headquarters and we'd be shooting the building to do for cutaway shots and someone would go over and the cameraman would pull down a branch to try and get that into the foreground you know so you get some sort of foreground object going on um, and get that slightly out of focus and uh, this was the same kind of thing just adding something in the foreground with a little bit of uh, with a little bit of blur which I haven't added to this lens blur which I could um, just gives that a little bit more depth and see how it sits in front of the fish as well. This is the only layer that really sits in front of the fish. Everything else is sitting behind them. And that's a really effective uh, way to give this a lot more depth. So that's the bubbles. Next, what I wanted was um, some overall distortion because, I mean, I didn't look at any sort of uh, references for this. I didn't go and look at some uh, you know David Attenborough and stuff like that to see how fish look underwater but from memory I thought you, you would see some distortion uh, underwater um, so I decided to use another distort blur layer on top just turn that on and that's also once again using the same distort blur map that we used earlier for the ocean and it's just a subtle distortion let me just turn it on and off just like that and we'll play back the final in a moment. Actually, no, I'll just, I'll just preview that now. And um, take a, a sip of my tea. Hey, shout out to Larissa watching on YouTube. Larissa. Yay. Larissa, the Khaleesi, queen of Sapphire. Yeah. Uh, Larissa and the, all the Sapphire development team and all the developers of Boris FX. Thank you. Thank you for making these great tools. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, and so, and so, so uh, helpful too. I, I just happened to suggest um, in a feature request that it would be great if S Gradient had a, um, um, a swap colors option. And that was added like the next day. Uh, that's, <laughs> in, that's, that's in, that's in 2020.5, just gradient swapping colors. I tell you, that's so useful. So it's so great to be part of the team and be able to, um, make suggestions that really change the software. Um, it's very Larissa, empowering. Larissa, the hardest working woman in show business, writing Sapphire, um, homeschooling <laughs> right now, right? Uh, raising her son um, and still writing amazing code. Uh, thank you, Saf. Thank you, Larissa, for all your hard work. I don't Absolutely. say it enough. I don't say it enough. So, okay, so look, so there's, there's the preview um, of where we are so far. And... Uh, it wasn't a super fast preview, but imagine how much longer that would have been if I hadn't pre-rendered that background. So at this stage, um, I was pretty happy with it, but something just clicked with me and I thought, well, surely, you know, water, you know, water moves, you know, it's very heavy and the fish are sort of moved around in the water when it moves. So I thought, <coughs> excuse me, it might be good to add some movement. So what I did was use the, um, the wiggle expression. 
And I'm going to do that right now. So if I just solo position, and I'm going to, I have to wiggle both the top layer and the bottom layer. So I'm just going to, I'll click on position and type in wiggle. And I only want one wiggle per second. And I want a, um, a value of 20. So that's going to wiggle the movement slightly. And I want to do the same for the top layer. So I'm literally just going to drag the parent link and just come down to position like that rather than type the expression twice. Let's just preview that. And I tried rotation, but rotation looked odd. <coughs> I think this makes a huge difference to this look. <coughs> look at that difference. Now it really feels like there's some weight behind the water. Um, I don't know about you, but when I, when I did that, I thought, oh yeah, that looks so much better. And imagine if the fish were swimming at slightly different speeds and um, there was a little more difference between, you know, maybe one's darting across and, you know, there's other little, little, little um, fish in there or other creatures that would be uh, pretty cool. So that looks really nice. And the last thing on, on top of that was just the curves effect. Just, uh, just bringing down the mid-tones um, just, to, just to darken that a little bit. Just like that. And we ended up with, you know, with the final look. Very cool. And you can see, this, see the distortion over the top, just a little bit of distortion. But I think the ocean <clears throat> actually looks pretty good. You, you do get a sense that they're underwater, don't you? I mean, like I said, not, not photo real, but you know, how many times have you seen a school of soy sauce fish swimming around? They're not supposed to be real, but it's, but it's close enough to feel like it's under the ocean. So I was really happy with that look. So let's, um, let's talk, let's open up to questions and um, um, let's jam it a little bit. Cool. Sorry, I was just I was just playing your full screen render there. Um, amazing stuff, John. Amazing stuff. If you want to go ahead and stop screen sharing, I'll throw us into um, gallery mode. Thank you. So much fun to create that kind of thing. And I've got the I've got the tools I need in Sapphire. You know, and combined, I'm I'm never afraid to shy away from the default After Effects effects either. If I think there's going to be something that can do it better, you know, I'll do that. But Sapphire um, really came to um, the fore with you know with these, with, especially with its displacement and the and the textures in the ocean, and the zebra, of course. <clears throat> now, Great question job. question for you, John. From me, this is from me. <clears throat> like I look at that setup <clears throat> and I see that you've used you've used Sest Effect already and put a couple things together. But like my, I always think after I see that is how could I get as much of that together into one builder preset as sure. at time and then like, you know, be able to stick, you know, a layer in as, as an input and, and then have all that as, as one preset. Do you ever go back and think about that and how you can collapse this down into one effect? <clears throat> yeah, I, 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 I do. Um, and now, now that you mention it, you could probably do a lot of that background um, in one effect. The question is, um, I mean, one of the reasons to do that is if you're going to share the S effect, you know, you're going to create something that someone can just drop in and boom, it's finished. Um, you can uh, use different uh, of different tools in S effect to, you know, um, mask certain areas. And I probably could go back and rebuild it. But my workflow, I mean, I've been using After Effects for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And my workflow, um, I think, unless I have a very specific reason to build it in one, because I can't do it any other way, um, is literally to duplicate layers, change settings, use masks. I find that very fast and very fluid and also very easy to change. Um, you as a, um, as, a, as, a, as a creator of the software <laughs> you know, might approach slightly differently, but, I also, yeah. but, I, I, but I'm also, obviously gonna look for the fastest way to do it. Um, but once that's done, once you had built it uh, as one thing, and obviously you can make it modifiable um, by isolating certain parameters that you can only see in your host. Uh, it could be very useful, but um, this is the way I, I work 
um, as I'm sort of jamming looks. But I have done that, Brian, uh, um, Alan. I've gone back when I've made something, particularly with like uh, some of the uh, bokeh presets that shit with Sapphire. I've, tr I've built them with multiple layers and After Effects and thought, hang on, I can go back into S Effect and do this all in one effect. And there's a, there's a number of presets in S Effect created by me and by you that actually, you know, would have normally been multiple layers, but uh, just well, single effects. I, I look at this and you, you, know, you applied a couple <laughs> of your presets there and then you put the distort on and you put the rays on there all together. And in my, in my mind, is, and I'm just going, okay, this is, John's just created a third, the deep, preset right here and ready to go oh, pretty much yeah I, I i should go the in and deep combine. the deeper yeah deepest deep <laughs> deep, deep 2.0 that's right well the deep right the deep. um yeah but yeah, those two could easily be combined that background yeah could be combined even it might not look exactly like that but it, it would look pretty close and if if and for those of us uh, uh those who might be watching who have not used builder before um John can um, go in there and, uh, as he's done in other presentations, turn off uh, different parameters so that there were only the controls that were applicable. Um, yeah. You want somebody to mess up the effect by changing something that was really critical and yeah. make it a more manageable effect. And so you're really building a new effect. It's not just a preset. It really is a, you know, kind of a new, think of it as a new effect. Totally. That's and that's not just to control um, what other people can click. In many ways, that's a workflow choice. Um, when you want to work fast, you, but you've built something in S-Effect that you, you, you know you're going to use later and you know you're going to modify later, but you don't want to go. Some of these effects have many parameters. You want to be able to have laser focus only on the things you know you want to change later. So turn everything else off. There's a global button to click all the parameters off and then just go in and just cherry pick just the ones you think you might, like color or random C, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, that just isolates them um, right uh, in there in the effect control panel. Or in or in the effect panel based on your host. <clears throat> gotta, gotta gotta thank Nick for um, going sixteen by nine on us. Nick, love it, love it there. Oh, yeah. I didn't even notice. <laughs> and his mic's off. And his mic's off. And his screen's <laughs> off behind him. Uh, <laughs> your, your, your mic's off, Nick. <laughs> um, You're on mute, Nick. Yeah, yeah, Nick's on mute. He's he's okay. Um, hey. I'm right. Here he is. There you uh, John, I was just going to say, some people have no idea what a CD is that you pulled up. So you got to be very conscious of that. Well, that's, a, that, that's, that's even a DVD. It's right? like, what is that in his hand? I have no idea. Physical, physical media. It's even got the date on it. Look. Yeah, where, where do you put that? Uh, <laughs> awesome. Sapphire I, version yeah. one released in 1998, right? How Man. crazy is that? Man, uh, I used I used to put everything I did on discs, and I had two huge boxes full of discs, and, and I probably opened about two of them. They're all sitting on a hard drive now. About testament, no. testament yeah, to that. Testament that beautiful code Gary and Call wrote in 1998 that you know we're demoing um we're demoing Sapphire in 2020. Um, love, yeah. love Zeebler, man. Zeebler, like, you know, one of those effects that, you know, we, you know, so many people use Sapphire in so many different ways, right? Um, mm. it's all over the place. Um, and you, you meet people like yourself, um, or like Jesse Newman's a good example, right? Um, you guys can Google Jesse Newman VFX. He's a, he's a crazy Sapphire user, but there's certain people out there that like Zeebler is one of those effects like, oh no, no, I use it all the time you know yeah. like yeah like i don't want to bake um i don't want to bake you know the blur into c4d and then god forbid have to change that right and change mm. that render i want to yeah. keep it live and composite and they they love z blur like um for the quality right and for the parameters and the easy use and the speed so yeah um, that's definitely like an unsung hero in the in the sapphire suite and it, it is i mean z blur is not in camera blur right it's not it's yeah. not the same as the blur you can do in 3D. Sometimes you might have to do it in 3D, especially when you're doing really, uh, you know, um, really shallow depth of field. Mm -hmm. um, where you're really focusing right in on some text or, you know, something really shallow. Because um, you're probably not going to get exactly the, the results you want from a, you know, a 2D version of, of, a, of an actual um, 3D blur, you know, actual depth of field. But 95% of the time, you only want a little bit. And you just want to change that focal depth. Um, so it's definitely much faster to do it in post. 
Um, and everyone out there should follow us on Boris Effects. You know, um, we're going to be creating a ton more content, right? So excited to have John on board. A lot more oh, builder yeah. tutorials, a lot more yeah. SFX tutorials. Um, so much yeah. to talk about in Sapphire. Mm. Uh, I love it when people say, like, show me everything in Sapphire. And I'm like, well, that's going to be a 12-hour 12, 12 demo. <laughs> it, is, it is a huge suite of plugins. But thank you, John. That was an amazing presentation. Yeah, always, love, always love your style. Very calm. And um, sometimes I get love lost. Love the Ant-Man in the back there, John. <laughs> Ant-Man. Yeah, Ant -Man. yeah, of course. It's my, my, favorite, my favorite Marvel character. Okay. All right. Let's um let's stop torturing people and let's um let's give away some prizes, right? Um this is the last presentation for virtual NAB. Thank you everyone for tuning in, staying with us. Thank you everyone for muddling through all my technical glitches. Um, but appreciate everyone's patience, appreciate everyone's time watching us uh while they're at home right now. Um that is not lost on us. We hope everyone out there is safe. We're happy to to do something to give people distraction um, for a little bit. Let's let's give away some from prizes. Mark Hamilton watching on YouTube. Congratulations, wow. Mark. You win um, the summer session of School of Motion. So mm -hmm. you are in for a treat, man. You are in for a treat. Uh, Mark Hamilton on YouTube. Stacy Lee on Facebook. Congratulations, Stacy. You win one year of Adobe Creative Cloud. Uh, amazing gift. So thank you to our friends at Adobe. Uh, for donating that prize, Stacy Lee on Facebook, um, Bella Luna on Twitter, um, and I will read the hashtag. It is a at b e l l a l u one three five three five four nine zero. Bella Luna on Twitter gets Cormel <laughs> Chromatics plugin. Um, congratulations to Bella um, on Twitch. Right, this is new for us. This we just created a Twitch account. Um, a couple days ago so the amin generalist amin generalist watching on twitch congratulations you win the boris effects bundle nice on our sapphire continue nice. local pro shout out to twitch awesome thank you for watching us on twitch um marcel henry on youtube marcel henry um you win the boris effects bundle sapphire continue mocha pro one year subscriptions congratulations marcel henry um, Duwan Edwards on Facebook wins a silhouette one year subscription to the full silhouette. Um, Duwan Edwards on Facebook. Congratulations at beach TV, AKA Aaron, Aaron watching on Twitter at beach TV wins a one year subscription to silhouette paint. Momo J on YouTube watching Momo J wins a render garden license from tool farm. Really cool. Really cool. Um, background rendering plugin so momo j on youtube um wins render garden and the last prize we're gonna wait um at ron sussman aka edit two watching on twitter that is at r-o-n-s-u-s-s-m-a-n -S -S edit two on twitter wins the akusanos era for bundle pro congratulations to all our winners and thank you to all our sponsors for making this all happen and donating all of these gifts for us to give away thank you so much That's everyone great. Um, thank you, John, for an amazing presentation. That thank you. Awesome. Look I'm glad to have the opportunity forward. because if, if I wouldn't have been at NAB, so um, you know this whole situation actually has a has a silver lining for me to be able to present to yeah. you guys. Yes, we love you, John. Yeah, thanks, ha Nick. Happy I to have you. you. <laughs> happy to have you on the team. <laughs> um, and we are going to be doing more of these live streams as well. So everyone out there, yeah. if you enjoyed this stuff, follow us. Um, on YouTube, follow us on Facebook. We're going to be doing more of this stuff because we are home yeah. like yourselves. Um, so we will be doing more live streaming as well and doing this type of content we'll be doing this week. But we are not actually done. Next week, we are doing three webinars. Um, so Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we are focusing um, a full hour on Continuum, which is on Tuesday. Uh, Mocha Pro on Wednesday and Sapphire on Thursday. I could have totally butchered those dates. Um, go to Boris. No, you didn't. Actually, that's right. No, that's that right? right. Yeah, that's just that's right. Right. You know? Hey, I get lucky. I get lucky at the end, right? <laughs> um, so those are all going to be webinars. Sign up um, via the Boris Effects like on the website. Just go ahead and on the homepage, click on the news item on the NAB sale. 
and you'll find the links to all those webinars. Those are going to be like product updates, so specifically focusing on the new things in Continuum. John, you're going to be showing off the new features in Particle Illusion, right? That's uh, right, and also some some of the new Title Studio stuff. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Alan and I will be taking Sapphire, right? We'll be showing off some fun stuff. Alan's going to be deep diving nice. some lens flares. I'm going to be showing some new fusion support. Um, so some really cool stuff in coming in Sapphire. And uh, Mary and Ross are going to be taking Mocha and showing off some of the new improvements to Mocha, like um, new support for Flame GMAS Tracer, which is really exciting. Um, so that is continuing all next week. So that is going to be a wrap for us for virtual NAB. We have been live for three days. Don't it's forget, Brian, super fun. You know, there's a sale going on. Oh, up. my God. Thank God we got, we got the VP of Global Sales. Up. Come yeah. on. Nick, tell them, tell, them what, tell them what's for sale. Perpetual uh, bundles as well as 25% off everything else, one license per customer. Uh, all prices valid till Friday. So feel free to contact me at nick at borseffects.com. Uh, sales at borseffects.com or your account manager or anybody and we're happy to help so um, we want to help people save some money so feel free to come on down and bye 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 yeah no thank thank god like we subscribe and share like and subscribe, and subscribe and share, share. boris effects nab said 100 yes 25 percent off any product 50 percent off perpetual um bundles so if you want to get sapphire and continuum or if you just um all of those multi-product bundles are 50 percent off um, if you want to just upgrade to ladies version of Sapphire, 25% off. That is running till Friday at midnight, right, Nick? That's when it's going through. That, that's that's so, right. My phone is on. Great time. Great time to, to get into Sapphire or try out the new silhouette paint or anything. Um, you know, um, now is the best time. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in with us. We appreciate the time. We appreciate you guys spending a couple of days with us. We've had a great time. Um, it's been a blast. Now I can go sleep. <laughs> All right. So yeah. <laughs> uh, appreciate everyone. Um, and so signing off for this year's virtual NAB. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Bye, everyone. See you next time. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.